Here we go. We got the intro. The main event of the evening. Hey, I got to start that over again. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. And now, for those in attendance streaming on YouTube around the world, it's time to throw down with ITR Boxing Inside the Rope. Pretty freaking cool podcast. And now for your host, he can be found on the golf course or in any boxing gym hailing from Pleasant Hill, California. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Luki Lights Out Cartel. Okay. So that's our super professional intro. Yeah. Shout out to the Fight Night Voice for doing that. A great ring announcement. What's up with my guy, Boxer at Gray, man? I see you on the streets. Hey. Thanks for having me on, man. Pleasure to be on the Lukey podcast. Big dog, have me on. Always appreciate it. Uh, yeah, happy to talk some boxing with you, man, on this uh, very uh, nice uh, Sunday afternoon uh, in New England. So Yeah, you know, you know, Cam Newton came through for y'all, and hopefully <laughs> Uncle Lukey can come through with you with a somewhat decent podcast. But, um, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good time to be alive, except for if you're in California where there's, like, more smoke than the 2000 Up in Smoke Tour. But, nice. yeah, there's a lot of smoke out here. But I want to start right off the rip. We're going to put you on, on Awkward Street. Not Awkward Street, but uh, the streets are saying a lot of these Mexico, Mexico cards, they keep hitting me up about this. I don't understand a thing. It's kind of boring to me. Can you just get it out there and just say what's going on with the Rosarito cards? Yeah, so I think right now, like I, I think we've seen more fighters from the southern, you know, California. I, I just I want to say the whole California area are going down to Mexico for the fight, and it's kind of a crapshoot when you do these cards because there's so many different commissions down there, and they all have. I, I, so I, I'm mostly responsible for like the stuff that happens in the United States. So like, I want to make that clear right away that I'm not in direct con contract contact with these commissions myself. Um, but I like, I'm on email chains and I hear things, so I'm aware, but I'm not the one, like if you're, if your fights aren't on box rec, don't blame me personally or anything. Don't, um, you, know, you don't at you don't, don't, don't. Yeah. Leave me alone, please. I don't have time for this. Uh, I have, I don't get paid to do it. So it's like, I have a, I have a job outside of boxing. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but no, I've noticed like a lot of shows, some of them are get, get accepted by box rec and they're listed on the schedule. So if they're listed on the schedule before they happen, you're going to find, you're going to get the results for them for sure. Um, but yeah, some of these shows I see get added on like six months later and a lot of times it's we're we're just asking the commissions for the basics like give us video give us proof of like you know ids and and a, and a result sheet like really basic stuff and it you'd be surprised man a lot of these commissions just don't follow through on it and it's sort of like i feel bad for the fighters that go down there and they get wins or they have fights and and they want that recorded but at the same time we the commissions need to do their job so it's sort of like we're not going to just bend over and and let any old result on there they need to do their job too and we don't have people down in mexico so we need to have verification that these fights are legit and stuff so it's 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 definitely like a, a crap shoot if you're going to go down and fight there i'd say to anybody right now I, I understand why there are a lot of americans going down there to fight the opportunities to fight in this country are few and far between right now with COVID. So a lot of people find it tempting to go down to Mexico. Um, but I would say go, if you're go look at the area you're fighting in, do you see results on box track for those shows in the past? Uh, if so, that might be a good place to fight, but like some, some parts of Mexico, I, I wouldn't really recommend. No. So there's my, there's my long answer. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll just throw back and I'll kind of like add my two cents. Also, I see Dre in the chat. What up Dre? Um, what the way I'm looking at this is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong or right or say whatever is, it looks yeah. like there's certain places that are kind of preying upon people not being able to get fights, be active, yeah. and they're they're just kind of rushing these things out. They're not maybe being the most professional about it, and you really don't know if these are going to be recorded or if they're going to be viewed as exhibition bouts. But they're just taking five hundred, six hundred dollars, whatever the number is, yeah. from these fighters out of their pocket knowing that they want to stay active and that's kind of the that's the way i'm looking at it it's almost like going to like a for-profit college where they're kind of <laughs> preying upon people that want something 
Yeah, no, it definitely is. I mean, there's, you should, like I say, go, you know, if you're going to do business with these promoters in Mexico, go see, are their shows listed on box check before they're actually happening? Because if they are, that means we're accepting them and they pass the standard check. I don't, again, I don't, you have to ask the owners of box track and interview them about why certain shows go up and some don't. But I know a lot of it is like, they don't really like the whole win guys going down and get buying wins basically. And they're like, well, if your whole show is just basically people on your car to buy wins, like we're not really interested in putting it on box track. Cause that's not like a good practice. Um, but if they have like a lot of local fighters and guys actually from Mexico fighting each other, it's like, all right, then we'll allow it and they can have a few Americans on the card or whatever. Uh, there needs to be like a mixture of that. So, uh, you know, I'd say just go look and see if you're the promoter you're working with has their shows up there already. And if not, um, you know, I'd say stay away. It's not worth it. You might not get your win recorded or it could take 10 months. You know, who knows? Uh, it's it's a, it's definitely like not an exact science right now. It's a mess. Yeah. And the other thing I'm looking at, too, is like it's dangerous, right? Because like eventually someone from America is going to go down there and fight someone that's not supposed to be in the ring. Yes. And you could also be on the wrong side of history for that as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's I not and to be fair, I see Americans go down there and they lose to these guys in Mexico. So you don't know, like you don't know necessarily who you're getting in the ring with. You think you think it's a guy that you're gonna beat and you're paying to beat, but it could be somebody that is a lot better than you they than the, you realize. So there's been plenty of guys uh, in California that I've seen lose in Mexico. Now it doesn't happen all the time, but guys go down there and they pay and then they lose. So well, that's recent. Miklo Arnold, Jesus Haro, these are like recent examples where guys are losing now, you know. Yep. But let's switch gears. Do you want to do we want to be a boxing business channel for a second, or do we want to talk fights? Which direction are we going, my no. man? Box work gray. I'll let you. I mean, you're the you know, the 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 head. I'm the host. host. I'm you're the host of the most. Tell me, yeah, the host of the okay. most. What do you want? What do you want to talk about? Let's let's just let's just kick some facts for people. Let's okay. let's do facts only because you know people lie but facts don't. And okay. Canelo Golden Boy Dazone. Yeah. The root of this issue to me seems like it's very simple. It's that there's a contract between Canelo and Golden Boy that does not match the Dazone to Golden Boy contract. That seems like at the very essence it's like I want to fight, I'm not being fulfilled on my contract based on my opponent's not being deemed fit worthy. And there's a contract that exists between two parties that I'm not allowed to see that I don't like. Am, am I understanding this issue? And let's break, up, break down on this issue. Yeah, I know. I think you're completely right. I think, um, you know, they Canelo expected to fight this year and they gave, they offered up some opponents. The zone turned it down. And they weren't able to make it work. And now they basically are like, well, if you're not going to pay me, I'm going to sue you and get out of my contract. I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple. And if you look at the lawsuit, I mean, that Canelo filed the team, by the way, they need to re they're going to have to refile that lawsuit because <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize uh, that when you file for something like this, that, that the lawsuit, like the number of pages usually are in the hundreds. And this was like a 27 page lawsuit. <laughs> so they're like, they're missing a lot of information. Uh, I mean, it's one, one side of the story so it'll be interesting to see what DAZN has to say but I mean yeah Canelo obviously expected to uh you know they threw out some opponent names DAZN said we're not interested and and they're not going to pay Canelo and they wanted to pay him less what they what they promised so yeah it's just they they're not paying what they promised and that's why they're getting you know DAZN's going to get sued now and I think they'll probably end up settling personally they're going to probably settle out of court I don't know if, you know God, who knows what, what amount it will be but I think you know this will probably get Canelo out of the, that deal, and I think that the relationship in general between Golden Boy and DAZN is not good. Um, I think we'll maybe see one or one, maybe two shows from Golden Boy on DAZN for the rest of the year. So I think there's just it's a lot of rocky and icy relationships right now, and I don't really see things getting repaired. And it will be interesting to see. Uh, I think when this gets settled up early next year, where Canelo ends up going. So much interesting thing in the DAZN network, right? Because we got all these young fighters. One of my favorites is Mark Castro. You got another one of my favorites, Otha Jones the third. Another one of my favorites, Devin Haney. They're tied to kind of the matchroom yep. portion. I know Devin's more his own contractor, but has association with matchroom. It's pretty obvious Golden Boy's not going to be on DAZN for that much longer, at least to yep. me. Maybe I could be wrong, but that's just my feeling. Yep. I don't really know what DAZN looks like moving forward. They haven't announced a fall schedule. 
My birthday's in October. It's almost October. Little strange that there's no fall schedule yet. It's, it's, just, very, I'm just very, strange. There. it's very strange. Um, I mean, everything they announce just doesn't, you know, there, there are no Golden Boy fights technically on the schedule. There are no match from USA fights technically on the schedule. They claim that they had a deal with Bare Knuckle Fighting Champion, you know, whatever that, that group is. And uh, from well, my knowledge, the, the Bare Knuckle card on uh, that took place two nights ago was on the Bare Knuckle app, not on DAZN. So I don't know what's going on, like what combat sports wise with DAZN right now. It's a, it's it's definitely weird. I mean, they're laying off people right now. The several people, good people, lost their jobs last week, which is a real shame. Um, you know, you know, I, I joke about DAZN a lot, but uh, I do. I was a day one subscriber, and I have enjoyed their shows, and I want them to succeed. But when you see no show schedule. Uh, people in America losing their jobs. It makes me think that they're probably going to not focus on boxing in America next year, and they're probably going to just stick with their international content. So that's just my two cents. I think the other thing that I fear, right, is we might be looking at a new Rock Nation situation where we oh. have fighters stuck in these situations. Because I'd like clarity on where does a guy like Mark Castro say they don't put on that many shows? Where does he go? Because what if Eddie Hearn doesn't want to fly him five times to the U.K.? Does sure. he get the opportunity to fight elsewhere? Like, to me, it just creates this mess if they're not around. And what scares me is you have Regis Progross, Mighty Mo Hooker, Josh Taylor. They all were on his own, and they're all leaving. Yep. And that fighters aren't dumb. So it's like if you see that these fighters, like Josh Taylor won the World Boxing Super Series on his own, and the first thing he does is go to ESPN. Yeah, yeah. And uh, – there's a technically there's a World Boxing Super Series final in 13 days from now. The cruiserweights uh, Dorcas and uh, uh, Maris Bradis are going to finally have their uh, final match, and uh, that hasn't been announced for his own. And I don't know where that's going to end up. I bet it, I wouldn't be surprised if it's just like the, the, you know Sourland just streams it on their website or something. So then that's content. That's again that's another boxing series that's consistently been on his own, but. I've heard nothing. I don't know what's going on with them, man. It's you hear when you hear more about layoffs than actual fight announcements. It's it's a red flag, very bad. Um, and now we wonder is Matchroom USA going to be done? Yeah, like you said, all those guys you're listing are they're in limbo right now. And they're the ones that really I feel bad for because Canelo can just like retire if he really wanted to, and like the young guys like Mark Castro, Nikita Bobby. I see somebody in the chat mentioning Alexis Spino as well. Like, there's a long list of guys that are all they all signed with Eddie, and uh, yeah, are they going to just like start fighting in the UK now? Like, <laughs> you know, like they need to be fighting in the US. So. Uh, a lot of people are going to be in purgatory next year. And I, I've tweeted out a while ago, like people need to come to terms that the landscape of boxing will change next year. Um, it's going to for sure. And it's going to be fascinating to see where everybody kind of, some of these players uh, end up. Yeah. Well, this is why I want to bring you on because you're real smart and you say smart stuff. Um, <laughs> let's talk about Dre's question in the chat real quick. Is yeah. Absolutely. Dre, Dre wanted to know a male Navarrete versus um, Ruben Villa. Uh, what do you guys it. think? I want okay. So can you you had a very spicy tweet about this earlier this week, and I think you should. I feel uh, like I just get people mad because I'm really in boxing gyms. So like I'll say stuff we talk about, kind of messing around, and I go on the internet, and you got a lot of people that don't go into gyms or they're kind of like social misfits, and then Twitter's their refuge for like being sure. knowledgeable, and I'll just get people really mad because I, I think Ruben's gonna beat him. The only way I see Navarrete winning is if he's one of these transcendent volume puncher guys that just is able to will his way past transcendent talent. Uh -huh. But Ruben, since he was a little kid, has always been like an extremely special fighter. And it's just hard for me to believe a guy moving up in weight who's more of a volume guy is going to beat one of the best amateur boxers I've ever seen. Now, I could be proven wrong. This could be Eric Morales, and I could look super dumb five years from now. But it's just, to me, Ruben Villa is one of the best fighters I've ever seen. He's got incredibly fast feet. I don't see Navarrete being uh, able to cut him off unless Ruben decides for some reason to stand in front of him, which would be like the worst game plan ever. I so, think, yeah. I think people were giving you a lot of grief because 
they like to, they go on what you've done and re, via's the opponents that he's beaten on his road to this title shot are i mean they're very you know he beat two good fellow prospects and he beat alexi Colado, who you know really never panned out and he had a nice looking record but he's not a guy that was ever going to be like even top 25 i would argue and i think navaretti is a huge step up in you know a competition in terms of what V has been with. Now, I think you're right. V is a great amateur. He was very cl close to representing the United States in the Olympics. And really, if Shakur, and if it wasn't for another fellow incredible amateur, if Shakur Stevenson, he might have made the team. Uh, I mean, you know, it's he just, uh, yeah, he would have for sure. He just happened to lose to also one of the greatest amateurs of like our last 10 years. Who, um, and let's, let's also, not to interrupt, but I just want to say this who Ruben had beat Shakur twice before that, and Shakur had made him. I believe is a screensaver on his phone leading up to the trials. That's how focused he was on Ruben. Oh yeah. Just to I mean, throw that out there. I mean, Ruben's beaten a lot of like he's, he has wins over. He beat Devin Haney in the amateurs. He beat Duke Reagan in the amateurs. He beat, uh, I want to say he beat Stephen Fulton in the amateurs. He beat Gary Antonio Russell, I believe, as well. So, I mean, these are all guys that have – and those names right there I just listed are all people who have great potential to win championships uh, in the next year or so. So, Ruben's beaten them all in the amateurs. He was – you know, I think people also – He's, he, he's going to have to definitely outbox this guy uh, for sure. He doesn't have a, a lot of power. And I think guys that have a little, that aren't big punchers, I think in general get a little bit more crap than the big punchers. <laughs> so I think, you know, I, 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 I trust you, Lukey. I, I'm very fascinated by this fight. I think we're going to, it's going to really be either Via's come coming out party or right. And maybe now already is just an incredible talent that moving up in weight won't, uh, affect him too much but ruben's got to be in there with a guy with a lot more tools in the in the in the in the toolbox uh than he's been used to so it's uh it's a big ask for him but i respect him for taking the fight uh good for thompson box thompson boxing as well uh for taking the opportunity uh, and he's earned it he's definitely beaten everybody they put in front of him he's moved his way up to wbo rankings like he should have um so yeah I, I think this is of the top rank fights coming up um I think, you know, obviously not the biggest fight, but it's, to me, maybe the mo one of the most intriguing. Yeah, and I think here's the thing about him. He's a southpaw. I haven't gone yep. through Navarrete's record, but how many good southpaws has he fought? Like, sure. that's something that nobody's talking about, right? Then mm -hmm. who's Navarrete sparring, right? Because it's like, yep. these are the things that build up. I don't know what camp he's in, but it's like, we, this could look like Herring versus Ito, where within 20 seconds of the fight, I go, Oh, Ito doesn't know how to fight a southpaw. Like, it was just <laughs> clear to me. It's like yeah. he doesn't know how to step against a southpaw. It looks yeah, like he didn't spar yeah. southpaws. This fight could look like that, or Navarrete could run at him and do that jailhouse stuff, and Ruben could be like, oh, my God, I didn't spar any jailhouse fighters. So yeah. it, it's very engaging. I shot a little video with Ruben – Camp is very, very tight. I wore surgical gloves and a mask and everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, to me, it's just, I'll, I'll say what I think. I think there's a bias against amateur boxers that are good amateurs don't turn out to be good pro boxers. There's a stigma amongst some people where they want to believe amateur boxing has no meaning towards being a great fighter. You even see it with Shakur. Shakur is greatness, right? Yeah. But some yeah. people will be like, well, you know, he's just amateur style. Well, if that's amateur style, please sign me up to be amateur style. Right? Right, right, right. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, Ruben was like, you know, he, he, again, I think Tom, I always say like Thompson was, that's their best signing they ever got. Like that's a guy that I was genuinely shocked. Um, didn't get signed by a big name promoter. And he was like a diamond in the rough. Like when Thompson got him, I was like, this is a guy that was like, again, almost made the team. He's beaten a lot of proven pros in the amateur game and was coming out of there. Like, you know, uh, 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 I was just like, I would assume a bigger promoter would have signed him, but he's definitely every fight that, that Thompson's put him, they've put him in with. He's, he's one, like how many rounds has he really lost in his whole career so far? Like I all don't know of his, not many, <laughs> like two, three, like he's, <laughs> he's pretty much blown through everybody. In his last fight, like, look at this. He, his new sparring partner, Ruben Severa was at, I was at the fight in Shreveport, Louisiana. He schools him. And then the guy comes and trains with him. 
Um, the yeah. the fight, his last show box headliner, Andy Vences, who I, I thought beat the guy he fought, but it was a real close blood and guts heart fight. Ruben beat that guy and it was dominant. Like, so when people look at who has he fought, he just beat a guy that went up to 130 who does a lot of what Navarrete does, just not at a world-class level. So to me, it's just kind of, it just shows once again, some boxing fans kind of can be fooled by the promoter. It's like how Boots yeah. Ennis, who we'll get into this week, Boots Ennis is one of the best fighters in the world right now. But not a lot of people yeah. say that because yeah. there's nobody there's nobody holding his name up, right? There's nobody on the big network saying, you need to care about this kid. Because the fight yeah. that needs to be made is Virgil Ortiz versus Boots Ennis for a world title. Yeah, We need to find out yeah. who's the guy. Yeah, because when you watch Boots Ennis, you definitely feel like, I mean, in Virgil as well, you're like, is these these are the guys that are going to carry the sport uh, in the next five years. At least I believe that when I see them both fight. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a, they're definitely both gifted. But I uh, just go back to Via real quick. I think you're if you're betting on this fight, you're going to get a great line on Via. Um, I think you will get you'll see Navarrete with wide odds because he's a world champion and he'll get highly overvalued by the betters. Uh, I think so. If you're looking for uh, a good value pick definitely uh ruben via i'm sure he'll you'll you'll get him at good odds it's worth it's worth throwing a couple bucks down to see what happens sounds like the betters are trying to call you to place a bit bet right now um <laughs> just to talk with uh our interaction with these people before i go back to the schedule notes uh santero media asked us about mark castro alexis espino nikita b i can't ever say nikita bobby I'm gonna call him, nikita. I'm gonna call him white chocolate white chocolate white, yeah, nikita bobby yeah white chocolate yeah yeah, or, and uh, Chico. Chico. Yeah. I guess I guess uh, our man, Mr. Media, kind of wanted us to expand on that. Look, we're not in the business of promoting fighters or having to be creative when situations go wrong. But my personal belief is the fighters among this list that have the strongest team and the most creative people behind them will succeed when pure chaos happens. Mm, I like that. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I think all these guys that are listed in the chat, I mean, I like Diego Pacheco a lot. I think Mark Castro is incredible. Um, I just feel really bad that Mark Castro hasn't been able to turn pro yet. And Diego Pacheco, uh, I, I think, is uh, he has just a big size for his weight division. And, you know, that guy could move up to, like, light heavyweight, I feel like, seamlessly. So, um, oh, yeah, he's a big guy. So, you know, I guess just like we said before, I mean, I just don't know where they're going to end up fighting next year. I mean, wh what if, you know, maybe Eddie works with like NBC, the sports network with that, that new boxing series that's kicking off. Like who knows? Like it, there's a lot of like potential there. I think the NBC, sh I think that NBC series, um, you're going to see the big, some of those big name promoters um, that aren't top rank or PVC. Like, um, like I feel like Matt Eddie could have a show on there. I think Lou DiBello will be back. I think, you know, maybe a man events has a card on there. So I think you're going to see a lot of players that have been pretty dormant this year. Um, maybe back at it again. At least I hope, I mean, at least if that, if the zone goes away and hopefully NBC will pick up the NBC sports network, will pick up the slack. And another guy I want to throw out there that, um, and then we'll transition to kind of our news and or to the to actually this perfectly transitions to my next topic. So okay. uh, Dimitri Bivol is kind of like one of these hidden gems of boxing where yep. like he really should be viewed as a special fighter. But yep. for some reason, he's just like one of these guys that's going to kind of fall. It feels like to me in the Demetrius Andre category where everyone knows they're good, but they're just going to have this career that's just like, why did the career go this way? Yep. Um, that's where he's kind of trending. Which yeah, I agree. Yep. And because I, I got to see him train once, and I was like, this guy is special. <laughs> it's just going yeah. in and out. He's a special fighter. And um, with Archer better be pulling, or not pulling out, but his fight being taken off, it really made me think about how desolate light heavyweight is. And it's terrible. Like, like no one cared about this Arter Better Beef fight. Not to be mean, I like my. No, 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 no. He, no one cared. It was a yeah, showcase fight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody really blinked when they announced last night that he had, had bad broke his ribs or something. But yeah, it's sort of a it's a pretty bleak division out there. I mean, yeah, but Bivol. I mean, he he has wins over Joe Smith and and you know and Jean Pascal, who are both 
still very relevant in this division and Bibble had very little issue with either guy. That's how good Bibble is. And I feel like he's a guy that I, I feel like he'd benefit more if he just went and go, went to go fight in Europe and became a star in Russia. Like I, I, I actually like, believe that. like, I don't, I think he, I don't think he's gaining anything fighting in America. I hate to say it. Like, um, it, you know, this is a guy that I think, if the European scene was strong as it was back in the day, like when I first was being a fan, like Germany had as much influence as it used to, or, I mean, Russia still has some, has some influence, but it's not like it used to be. Um, so yeah, I, I think if Bivol was just fighting in Europe consistently, he'd be a bigger star. He'd be like a Darius Mikulszewski and almost, and just a, an enigma, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Obviously not the same style, but people would be like talking about him more than like they, like they used to talk about Mikulszewski. It's just to me, I look at it and it's like he's fought all these guys at the wrong time. He fought Pascal and then people are probably like, oh, Pascal's done. And then he beats a guy. He beats Marcus yeah. Brown. And you're like, wait, he's back. Yeah. And then it, people forget that. So you don't know how many podcasts I've listened to where people suggest fights. And this is Bivol's a major culprit of this one. They suggest a fight where Bivol's already beat the guy. <laughs> and they act like it's never happened. So they'll be yeah. like, oh, Bivol, now Bivol needs a guy like Joe Smith. And you're like, well, he beat him like a he year ago. Him. He beat him. He, he he beat Solomon Barrera. He's beaten a lot of these guys who have been, you know, relevant. And he lost maybe three total rounds against all of them. So it's, you know, like the guy, the guy is great. I mean, if, at this point, you should, you know, Kovalev, like if Kovalev's ever going to fight again, I don't know, like what's going on with him. So like, again, that's another situation where he's with the promoter in main events that's not promoting shows right now. So I don't know what I don't know what's going on, man. Is he like, is he still with main events? Because I think he's just world of boxing now. Is he no, main he's, events? He's, yeah, he's still with main events. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh wow. I didn't know yeah. that. But yep. Yeah. Yeah. They um, still talk, I mean, I know some of the people there and they still talk about him and getting a fight for him. So it's there's still there's still a relationship there for sure. Okay, well, we touched on how barren the light heavyweight division is. I'm not a fan of these, like, Jamel Herring, Aquindo, Arter Betterby versus whoever he's going to fight. In him. Like, I'm fine, like, if, if fights are happening all the time. But when we're in Corona world, it's got to be Corona time. we got to have a little bit better fights. And uh, I yeah. think that, that better be if he's feeling okay, we just put him in with Joe Smith. Because to me, Joe Smith is a good fighter. I, I wrote an actual article saying he could probably be fight of the, fighter of the year. I know people want Clay Collar to be fighter of the year, but it's like if you even step up Clay's competition just a tad bit, it could get really rough. What Joe's doing, yeah. I think, is a little bit more impressive because he's like kind of sneaking in and beat two really good guys that he wasn't really supposed to beat. Um, yeah, but, you shouldn't be fighter of the year for beating a guy and like um, the journeyman and like the middle ass. Sorry, like I like Clay Collard, but like you know, let's go for guys that have bigger wins on their record. Well, it's it's like you're supposed to be up there with all Lee in them. Like you're, it's just gonna look like it's gonna look. I'm a big Clay Collard fan. I like the story. I actually picked him against Kaminsky, even though I like Kaminsky. I've had his dad on the show. He, but you got to be serious, like this guy. I'm, Try to find it. Well, I'm really trying to be a better person. But you get a lot of boxing fans, they, they're big pro wrestling guys. They like stories, and the story of Clay Callard just appeals to them. The working class American that fought himself up. Whereas Joe Smith beat Jesse Hart, and he beat, um, what's uh, the Alvarez. boring guy, Eldier Alvarez. And yeah. th like, even though he's an underdog in both of these fights, these are like kind of more purist fight fan. You have to be. You have to know who these fighters are. You have to remember. It doesn't feel as cool. Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. Um, you know, Joe Smith had a great year. Uh, I definitely think he. Should, you know, could he could he could be like considered. Um, uh, you know, not for fighter of the year. Maybe like if you were to rank your top ten best fighters who had the best years this year, he'd probably be up there. Um, especially against. I mean, Alvarez. He really blew him out. Like it wasn't. It was very one sided and. You know, Joe Smith's like, I think people were like, he can hit hard, but does he, he's kind of limited and he's kind of shown that no, he's not, he can, he can, uh, handle very, you know, two, 
two complex styles in the ring that he was in against this year. And he's now going to get a world title shot uh, against the winner of that light heavyweight fight in Russia. I, I think that card's still happening. And I know that was the undercard bout of better be of, um, but I imagine that fight hopefully is still happening. And then Joe Smith will fight the winner of that bout. So, I mean, Joe Smith will, you know, may end up with the WBO heavy light heavyweight title, and then he might uh, unify with better be of next year. I mean, so big, big plans up for him next year. It's going to be interesting. And just a early prog, prog, uh, early prediction. I'm not going to try to prognosticate there. I said the mm-hmm. word right. I didn't Tim Bradley out. Shout out to my man Tim Bradley. I love his commentary, by the way. Like <laughs> Andre Ward too. Um, I think that Joe Smith is just going to be a little, a little less firepower than Art or Better Beef. It's like the same person, but someone's bringing a shotgun and what someone's bringing a 45. And I just feel like yeah. Butter is just going to have just a little too much power in that fight. Yeah, uh, I think it will be pretty explosive. Definitely see a stoppage. Yeah, but I think these guys are going to fight many, many rounds. It will be a late round stoppage. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. Like, like I think it's going to be who's, uh, whose chin will hold up uh, during the fight. Uh, yeah, Joe Smith. Uh, I mean, you just look at his record and he, he has a very weird loss on his record to a guy named Eddie Camarino, who was like, not that good. And I was like, I remember early in his career, I was like, I was like, yeah, Joe Smith must have got exposed. I guess he's not that great. And then all of a sudden he, he comes back and he knocks Hopkins out. He beat Fonfara. Um, and here he is after, you know, the unsuccessful fights against Barrera and Bivol, he's won two more in a row and he's back in the top five. So He's a guy that's uh, definitely uh, rose up many times after uh, being down. So uh, I, I tip my cap to him, um, uh, and I look forward to that fight. Okay, that's very real. So let's get into the mean machine Zueski fight. Um, machine <laughs> didn't look too good. Just no. To, um, Zueski, Zuski, um, he looked all right. He looked like a good boxer. I feel like he looked just good enough to be a barometer fight for young emerging fighters on all networks because he's a free agent kind of like can Mm -hmm. you look better than the mean machine what did you because i really like hearing from you what did you leave this fight thinking um i think ziski exceeded expectations i heard he didn't spar for this fat for this fight he really couldn't because the restrictions of canada are like pretty tight right now so uh for him to go to, for, I had him ahead. I rewatched the fight because I was talking with Marquise Johns, a good, you know, good friend of mine, uh, mm-hmm. yesterday, and we were, and I was like kind of distracted, and I and uh, I saw the scorecards after the stoppage, and I was like, wow, Zuski was ahead on two of the three cards. I should rewatch that. But you know, rewatching it, yeah, he legitimately took four or five of the first six rounds. I thought Mean Machine was getting picked apart, um, and then it really just, unfortunately for Zuski, he just got caught really hard in the seventh round, like to the point where I was kind of surprised that the referee a didn't stop it or B they let him out for the eighth round because he was still very, very hurt in the eighth round. And, and literally me machine just bulldozed him in seven seconds in the eighth round. Like it was, it was like, he was already done. Um, but before he got caught by that, like vicious, it was like a 10 punch flurry at the end of that round, round seven. Um, yeah, he was definitely ahead. Um, he showed me that, uh, he can definitely compete. Um, with the higher level of fighter that I thought he could, I thought Zuski was sort of his, he was rated like number seven by the WBO. And I was like, I don't really see it. I don't, I'm not that impressed with this guy. He's been, you know, fighting Canada all these years against kind of, you know, middle of the road fighters and just kind of staying active, waiting for an opportunity. But, you know, he got, he got a little unlucky yesterday. He got caught. I think, um, you know, they fought a hundred times. I think maybe Zuski wins, you know, 49 of them, you know, it's hard, you know? So I was, I was more impressed by Zuski hanging in and winning rounds than I honestly was with Mean machine getting the stoppage. I think Mean machine was expected to win, but he struggled. Um, and now where do you go with him? That's the question. Now, now that Mean machine well, wins, it's like, I got, that- I got the answer. Okay. I got the answer. There's a guy he's with golden boy promotions. We're not sure when he's going to fight again. Let's put Mr. Machine in with Virgil Ortiz. Yeah, that would that, I agree with you. That would be the perfect fight for Virgil Ortiz. That that would be that would be like if they if Crawford moved up to junior middle and you vacate that belt, that would be like a good vacant title fight. Or they could just be in an eliminator and the winner then fights, you know, the Crawford who have, I feel I feel like they're waiting for the top rank and their heads is waiting for Crawford to vacate. So then they could have Mean Machine fight 
you know, whoever that number two is. And I would love to see it be Virgil Ortiz. And yeah, that's a fight that that would be the Virgil fight that gets Virgil into the top 10. So that would be, and I think Virgil would knock him out. Uh, I don't think it would be that hard. I think he'd knock him out in under seven rounds. The thing about machine is, and I want to state this because some blogs get this wrong. He's never changed his style. So, like, he's always been this guy that comes forward, and as he fights better and better fighters, people, I've heard the trend of saying, I wish he fought like the old meme machine. He's never been different. No. It's just when you fight better fighters, you can't do the same thing. You can't get away, exactly. You can't get away with what you were able to get away with when you're fighting eight and six rounders. You can look great when you're fighting those eight and six rounders, but the guys you're in against don't have the same tools as some of these guys who are higher rated. Ray Robinson showed us that, that he, that mean machine has problems with movers and Ray Robinson, in my opinion, got robbed in that fight. Um, and I didn't really thought he, he won many moments against Crawford. Uh, and, and he even, even before that fight, he struggled with um, Juan Carlos Abreu. Uh, so, you know, he's got power and that can definitely bail him out. And it certainly bailed him out yesterday. But if he's in there with a guy who's got it, you know, can is going to be able to move around that ring for 10 rounds and has a chin that holds up, he's going to have a lot of problems. No, I, I hear you. The thing to me about the Mr. Machine, I also want to take time to say Marco, Marco Contreras coached a great fight to him. I thought he was very concise and explained to him at every step along the way that he was behind in the fight yeah. and was being yeah, very are. clear. But like, there's a lot of coaches that don't guide a fighter to let them know where they're at. He was basically like, the fight's too close. And then he's like, yeah. you got to do more. He's giving him direct device, throw the right hand. I think that Marco Contreras is a really underrated coach that doesn't get a lot of appreciation. And I think that this needs to also be stated that if Marco wasn't in Mean Machine's corner, there's a chance he loses that fight. Absolutely. You know, you got to put it in your fighter's head that uh, you got to be honest with them. And if then you had a co coach that was complimenting him every round, he could end up losing that fight on points pretty close. So I agree with you on that. He was well on his way. Uh, Joe Gonzalez, guy I know pretty well. Um, I want to jump out because I put this on Twitter. What's up with this Joette's back? And we can't just say Shakur is like a phenomenal fighter that made Joette look average. Yeah. Joette, I know. Like, where did this, like, this is the Joette that we used to see? Like, why did we have to, like, pretend that for one fight he wasn't the same fighter? I don't know. It's kind of dumb to me. Like, I, I said on my podcast that I thought Joette was going to win this fight on decision. Um, and, you know, Mariaga he's sort of like the guy that is, if you're, if you're, if you're a legit like top 10 fighter, you're going to beat Mariaga. But if you're not, and you're not proven, you're, he, he's going to beat you. He's going to even maybe knock you out. Um, but yeah, Joette just, it was, he was, uh, you know, Mariaga started off looking all right, but then he kind of just looked a little long in the tooth as the fight went on. And, you know, Joette just showed his class and, uh, and he showed us that, you know, this is a guy that he's, he can beat the Mariagas. So that means he's, you know, he's above that top 25 level and we can start thinking about him in the top 10 now um, for sure. And uh, you know, yeah, just cause he lost to Shakur doesn't mean you completely write this guy off. Uh, he could definitely find another path to a world title shot. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, if anybody thought Mariaga was going to beat him, I was like kind of shocked. I'm like, really? Like Mariaga's kind of, Mariaga's getting kind of old and Joette's the one that's going to get better and better with every fight. He's only 26. He's got, you know, a few more years till he hits his peak. So, you know, I wasn't that surprised that Joette won like eight or nine rounds yesterday. Okay. Two takeaways. Joette took a lot of punches in rounds eight or nine and 10. He did. That kind of surprised me that he left with some souvenirs. It felt like Mariaga started to figure something out late in that fight. He did. Uh, second observation was uh, Joette Gonzalez versus Emmanuel Navarrete is probably like a fight of the year contender. <laughs> yeah, I think they would be throwing throwing bombs all night long. Uh, I mean, that's what's good news for for Navarrete right now is moving up to featherweight. Is he has so many names that they can put him in with, and yeah, Joette is like 
that probably is the fight that Joette wants and will be looking for uh, next year for sure. I mean, maybe he fights Jesse Magdaleno. That's an easy, easy fight to make. You would think in theory, maybe you get Zhu Can, the, uh, the, the guy from uh, China that uh, golden boy promotes. Um, you know, there's some names out there for sure that uh, Joette can fight, even though he lost to Shakur. There's still a path, like I said, to a championship. Um, it's just going to be interesting to see what path he decides to take. Yeah, it's just to me, like a guy, and I keep harping on Ruben Villa, Joette versus Ruben Villa would be a nightmare because you're just <laughs> fighting the same exact style that really made you look bad. You're fighting a southpaw who's slick. It, you know, that, that would be the tough fight. So, we yeah. touch on Joette, um, Mariaga probably going to be just kind of one of these guys where he beats a prospect every now and then, but he's kind of lower on the card. I'm going to always have a lot of respect for him because he beat my good friend, Guy Rob. He retired him. Mariaga is a really, really, he's the definition of a journeyman in a positive sense where he's like a gatekeeper who yeah. really secures that gate. Like you have to be a really high level fighter to get past him because he shuts the gate on people. Yes. Um, Anthony Chavez won on the undercard against Aiden yeah. Gonzalez. Yeah. Really, really weird fight. It was, he got hit by a, like, what was that? A knockdown with a headbutt in round one. And, uh, you know, lucky he's fighting in the one state that does instant replay and they change things several rounds after the fact it happens. I'm not a big fan of that. I do think it's good that you do instant replay, but they shouldn't be taking like four rounds to decide like, Oh, by the way, we're going to go all the way back to round one and change that from a 10, nine to a 10, eight. They need to make that decision a little bit quicker. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, that's a guy that he, he was fighting a guy that uh, definitely has been a spoiler in the past. That's uh, Adon Gonzalez, who beat, did beat Robisi Ramirez. Uh, so, you know, Adon can always say he's beaten a two-time Olympian, uh, Olympic gold medalist. But, uh, you know, uh, Chavez uh, knocked him down later in the fight, and, and he was the one that was looking better late. So um, a good win for him. I know he was coming off a loss like, well, like a year ago. So... Um, it, this is good for him because even though he's, I don't think he's signed with top rank or anything, winning in the bubble is going to open him up to more opportunities. So perfect, perfect fight for him. In my opinion. I mean, it's, it's a tough go when yeah. you're a young fighter and you got one loss. Yep. It's not, you know, the business is he's going to fight someone that probably is a lot better than him. And yeah. he's just got to, he's just got to fight better that day. Yes. That's the point. Um, we had this guy, Aileen. Coached by Brandon Krause, uh, Outlaws Boxing, knocked a guy, silly, I can't pronounce his last name. Pretty noteworthy guy. He's another guy where he's going to come in the wrong corner against some probably famous fighters down the road. And he's just going to have to do what he did this night to someone that people have heard of or know a little bit more. But he looks very tough and durable. Yeah, Ale Aleem got a nice body shot knockout when his uh, opponent's mom was being awkwardly interviewed by Mark Kriegel, which was bizarre. Um, yeah, Ale Aleem, I'm going to say his name, his last name is Jamuk. Uh, Jamuk Hanoff, uh, originally from Tajikistan, now fights out of Reseda, California. Uh, this was his second time in the bubble, so he came up a bit short um, a couple months ago against Martino Jules. But uh, yeah, I think this was a fight where it was pretty even. I thought Ramos was 7 2 and 1 during the fight, so these guys had both had some setbacks. But yeah, Aleem looks like uh, he's, he's learned his lesson in that loss. I love the body shot KO. Um, and again, this is another guy on your laundry list of long list of guys in California right now that are going to be big trouble, um, no matter who they're in against, uh, especially at the six, eight round level. So, um, yeah, curious to see if top rank brings him back again, but anytime you win in the bubble or you look good in the bubble, or you look competitive, um, right now when there aren't that many opportunities, it's a good, it's only can be a good thing. Uh, part of me thinks, uh, I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's in the same weight class as Chris Zavala, right? I mean, that uh, might be the fight. Yeah, Zavala is Zavala a featherweight, or is he is he 122? I think he's feather. Is he feather? Yeah, I mean, he'll be in there with another. He'll be definitely in there with another top ranked prospect. He'll be the guy that's going to give the top ranked prospect a test, and they want it. Elim is the guy that you're like, okay, is the guy that I'm, I'm signed and I'm giving this bonus to, is he good enough? If can he get by a lean? Cause if he can get by a lean, that tells me he's, he's going to be going far in, in the ring, you know, in the sport. But if a lean beats him, you know, then we know his ceiling. He might be, let's say, I won't throw names out there, but let's say that um, top rank isn't making as much money this year, obviously COVID-19. 
Maybe yeah. you put in a fighter you're not sure if you believe they're good enough, and if they lose, they get cut. Exactly. That's what I mean. That's what happens a lot on these shows. Honestly, we see lots of guys. I see lots of guys that get cut after one loss. So um, Aleem's like a, the perfect barometer opponent. So we'll see him again. I'm sure. Okay. Um, since you follow amateur boxing, USA Boxing yeah. is heading to Germany and I believe the United Kingdom. Close okay. personal family friend of mine, Charlie She is there, but Keyshawn is the U.S. representative. Any people that you think that the general Luki boxing people should be following right now outside of the people I've told people, O'Shea Jones, Keyshawn Davis, Charlie Sheehy, Raheem Gonzalez, um, uh, Richard Torres, like outside of these names, Tiger Johnson, just anything that you'd like to add since we're finally getting a little bit of AMI boxing back. Yeah. So I want to ask you, so are they doing like competitive matches or are they just going to do like training camps? Like what's going on there? Someone explained it to me and I didn't really listen all that much. So for, <laughs> I know that they're going over to somewhere international and there's going to be a bunch of teams there and they're going to be sparring and stuff. And from the sounds of it and don't get me um, confused or take me as an authority, but it basically sounds like they're making sure kids from each country are going and they're not just getting beat up. Okay. So, so I'm going to give you, yeah, that's good. So I'm going to give you three amateur boxers who are going to be going pro soon that I think I'm, I'm very interested in one. I'm sure you're familiar with Ernesto Mercado, um, mm -hmm. who was supposed to be fighting, who's supposed to be fighting yesterday. Uh, but I believe his opponent couldn't get cleared or I'm not really sure hundred percent sure what happened, but he, they've been trying to top ranks been trying to get him, uh, on this, on these cards and he's 18 years old and a guy that, um, you know, came very, very close to, uh, representing the U S in the Olympics, uh, or at least getting a chance to qualify and came, uh, you know, and the guy who stopped him, he, well, he didn't even lose to Keyshawn Davis. He lost in a walkover. So he, like, other than that, he was sick the day of the fight. Yeah, that sucks. That just sucks. I would have loved to have seen that fight with him and Keyshawn. But I mean, 18 years old and he was beating up a lot of the guys, you know, senior, you know, he hadn't been fighting at the, uh, you know, the open division, elite division, whatever you want to call it very long, but he was clearly successful. Uh, and he looked down his record and he hasn't lost too much in his career. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see um, him turn pro. Uh, great distance know. fighter. Very yeah. Great distance fighter. He's very elite. Yeah, definitely, and uh, I mean, again, that's it's a blow to U.S. Uh, USA Boxing that they lose him at 18 years old because that's a guy I'm sure they would have liked to have developed and maybe had him in the you know the next Olympics. But um, I think you know, 18 years old, turning pro for top rank, uh, you, you know, it's a good, it can only it won't it can't go wrong with that if you're trying to make money. <laughs> so I get it. Um, the other two names are guys that are turning pro next week on top ranks uh, bubble card. Two guys out of New York. Uh, one is uh, Kasir Goldston, a guy that uh, Massey. Has, yeah, yeah, uh, from Albany, uh, a guy that uh, was doing really well on the junior level. Um, he's had a couple of fights uh, representing the U.S. internationally as well, um, and he would have been a guy that I think would have uh, started to make an impact if he stayed amateur the next four years. Like that's another guy that probably would have been a contender for the 2024 Olympic games. Uh, so definitely Kassir Goldston, take a look at him. And uh, was, um, just to add to that, his father, Ty Trax believes that international competition is the sex success to developing a great fighter. Yeah. So the thing that's unique about Mazzy is pretty much every year he did multiple international boxing tournaments. He so, did. and, and the thing that I know about him is every person that sparred him tells me he's physically strong. So he's physically stronger than most people. I'm not saying he hits harder, but like, if you grab him, it's like, you're not breaking free. Yeah. His dad entered him and he's for a 17 year old. He's probably fought in more international boxing matches than the average or most, the most Americans in USA boxing. Like his, he would fight, he would fight beyond just the typical tournaments that you would see the U S team enter. Like I think his dad probably entered him into stuff on, on their own. Um, but yeah, like he fought in Serbia. He fought in, uh, I know he fought in like Hungary, Spain. I think he was an, I think he's fought in Ireland. So they definitely, he's definitely been exposed more to the international um, opposition in the young age than the average amateur um the other guy turning pro is uh jahi tucker not too familiar with him but i know he's from deer park new york 
Um, it's another guy that's had, he's, I think he's had a little bit of international experience. He was in, he, he was, um, over there in Hungary last year along with Goldston. So, uh, Tucker's also 17 years old. Um, from, I was compiling his record and researching him a bit again, guy that's usually won his fights. So I'm curious to see, uh, what both of these guys look like, uh, in the pro games. But yeah, I just thought, I just saw they were both turning pro and that really, uh, it, it is such a young age and definitely raised an eyebrow. So, and they're both with top rank. So we'll see them. I'm sure we'll see them, uh, matched accordingly and moved along by Brad Goodman, one of the best matchmakers in the business. Well, he's the, he is the best, you know, Brad yeah. and Bruce are the best, you know, they, yeah, they, are. they know, they, they know are. how to guys. They, I mean, look, their track record's incredible. Yeah. So let's break down some fights and then let's leave. And I'm going to watch my golf tournament this evening. <laughs> so, Erickson Lubin is fighting Terrell Goucher on Showtime. Fairly good yep. fight, but this feels like um, Erickson Lubin. To me, it feels like Terrell Goucher is kind of like, um, I don't want to slander a guy, but I'll just say it. You know how Jamel Herring is an Olympian, but like you kind of never get that intimidation factor with him. Like You forget sometimes he's an Olympian. Terrell yeah. Goucher feels like the continuation of that. Like a Pinklin <laughs> Thomas. I'm not trying to disparage him. My friend, no, no, my no, friend no, no. Um, Prentice not, Brewer, yeah, he's is not a great guy friends with. Yeah, and we maybe, don't talk about it. Yeah, and it's also like maybe that's the fuel for because what I've heard on the inside is Boucher is a guy who has a chip on his shoulder in this camp, and he's very focused, and he's very like he feels like nobody's respecting him going into this fight. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think Lubin is the guy everybody thinks will win. Everyone's going to talk about. Um, Goucher is, you know, those two. What are the two most notable fights he was in? He got he lost to Lara. He got knocked down in a fight that was pretty forgettable. And then he had a fight. He got that draw with Austin Trout, who another guy that I think a lot of people are, think is kind of past his best. Um, in a fight that Goucher, you know, I think was supposed to win or was expected to win, and he didn't. And it was a, another forgettable fight. So I think this is now he needs to, uh, you know, Lubin is still only 24 years old. I mean, I know he had that tough knockout loss to Charlo. Um, that would, you know, ruin a lot of fighters, but this guy's still very young. Um, I think he, he still has ways to go in his career. And so it's hard for me to not back the young fighter here. Um, Goucher is 33, and I think I, I think the opportunity. This is really it for him um, in terms of big, big opportunities. So that's just my feeling on it. I think I think Lubin will. I think Lubin will. I don't know if he'll get the stoppage, but I, I expect Lubin to win this fight. I genuinely have no clue how this fight's going to look because, like, Lubin's been looking great, and I my feeling is Lubin's going to win because all the really good fighters know Lubin and like him and that always means something to me if like everyone that's good grew up around him yeah but at the same time Goucher is kind of like a wounded rattlesnake and that the wounded rattlesnake is the most dangerous rattlesnake because then they sure. know they're on their last stand and we've seen Lubin be extremely vulnerable in fights Absolutely. so it feels like this fight was made because when Goucher has been in big fights they're extremely boring and he makes them too competitive that's yep. what it feels like to me yeah uh, yeah yeah, I think he'll win rounds here, and I think it will be close. But I, I know I think this is the time. This is the guy that Lubin needs. He has to get by if he really wants to, you know, be the star, the star and the champion that he really believes he is. This is the. This is the. This is it. This is the gatekeeper. If Lubin wins, who does he fight? Ooh, that's like a who's really the belt good. fight? Oh man, that's a good question. So if he wins this fight, so he would win the like a WBC. He would be pretty highly ranked in the WBC, I believe. So. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, I don't think he would be necessarily rematching Jermel Charlo. <laughs> I don't think I mean, he would consider Charlo Rosario. I don't know. I don't think he would. But if Charlo beats Rosario, Charlo is probably going to only be pay-per-view from now on. And yeah, that and is a fight that could be pay-per-view. Maybe. I mean, do people really want – did they really want to pay to have him – have Charlo rematch a guy he knocked out in one round. I don't know. Uh, it's I, I do think Lubin is still has still very talented at 24, but like I don't know. I think it's a little bit of a hard sell in my opinion. That's just that's just how I feel. But I mean, I don't know. Would you? But I mean, look at the other names like Lara. He could fight Lara, I guess. What about Jared Hurd? Could fight Jared Hurd absolutely, or or, or J Rock. I mean, those are there's. I think J Rock's too much for him. 
Ooh, yeah, no, I, I ah, J Rock, man, I was so, I was so feeling so high on him, and then Rosario just like blew my mind in that fight, and I still just, I'm like, wow, J Rock looks so good, so good against Hurd, like so confident, and just like really impressed me, and then. Rosario just came out of nowhere and <laughs> just blew it out. Here's the thing, and people got to remember this. Punchers can punch. Yeah. And that's a charge it to the game. He got caught. Yeah, he did. Because he, he wasn't did. looking bad in the fight. He got caught, I believe, in the – did he get stopped in the fifth? He got stopped right. in the fourth. And then it's like, that's yeah. charge it to the game, you know, because – Yeah. It just shocked me. But, I mean, but like you just said, there's so many guys that are on that list for Lubin to fight if he gets by Gausha. So I think this is the start of something really good for him, potentially. Um, but he's got to get by this guy that definitely, I think, does have the chip on his shoulder. So I'm excited for that. I think it'll be a good main event. And we have a nice little undercard, too. Uh, we got King, two of my favorites, King Tug on the undercard. Super good. I King love, Tug is ridiculously good. He's really talented, and um, I don't write him off after the Gary Russell loss because Gary Russell's amazing as well. But King Tug's still 28 years old, um, and he's in there with a guy, Kobe Abridi, who um, I, I is gonna be. It's gonna be a really hard fight for him. He's if you look at Kobe Abridi's record, uh, he has been fighting on under deep on undercards on these PBC shows, and uh, has not been in there with anybody like King Tug. The guys he's beaten are fellow prospects or low level fighters. And, uh, King tug is to me, uh, you know, I think he's really a great talent. So, uh, I think, you know, I love watching King tug fight. I think it will be, uh, entertaining. He's a very TV friendly fighter. So I expect King tug to get the stoppage at some point. And then we have boots Ennis against Juan Carlos Abreu, which I mean, we talked about boots earlier, an incredible talent, a uh, guy that, I mean, He's never he's been past the fourth round once in 25 fights. He's everybody they put him in with. He he gets out of there pretty fast. It's and not a lot of boxers can do say can do that this the, in this era. Um so um Abreu is a proven tough opponent, a guy that goes rounds, a guy that's given a lot of good fighters problems. So it'll be interesting to see how DP takes boots into that fight. Um if boots can knock him out, does he lose rounds to Abreu? I mean, Abreu had knocked down Jamal James. He gave me machine a really hard fight, a really close battle. Um, so I, I promoted I, by someone I know well, Paco Damien, Paco Damien. So, yeah. So a uh, really, really interesting fight. I think he's rated, he's rated very low on box rec, like 125 or something. And it's like, I think he's much better than that. So, um, really good fight for boots to, to see where he's at. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy who's not going to, fight him like an idiot no like he's gonna fight in a very specific way if worst if he feels like he can't win the fight he's just gonna try to spoil it yep like this is gonna be an interesting test the big thing i look at besides the fight itself is how did top rank lose out on boots in us because they don't have that many welterweights Uh, here's a guy that wasn't aligned I know he had a show box contract. Maybe they had the show box fulfillment, but you got to get boots in us over there. Cause yeah. that's a guy realistically in a year or two that could fight Crawford. And I'll say it. He's the type of fighter that might beat Crawford. Yeah, I don't know what his, I don't know what his promotional, I know he had some, some legal issues with his promoters and stuff. So I don't know who's controlling his career right now or what, but he needs to be with somebody bigger for sure. I mean, I think he's on this card not because you know Al Heyman or Tom Brown wanted him on the show, but show like Steven Espinoza wanted him on the show. So he needs to be associated with a bigger name, in my opinion, if he's gonna be getting the fights he deserves. And I think, like you said, Abreu's not gonna fight him like a dummy. And he's I think the couple of the guys he's been in with lately were kind of tailor made for him. Like Ayubov was a dude that just kind of came right at him, and I thought I w- I expected that fourth round stoppage. I think Abreu. Um, knows how to protect himself in there. He, he, he knows, he knows when he's over, he, he's getting a little bit over his head and he can slow the fight down and frustrate Ennis and tie him up. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how, you know, if boots can stop him. That's what I want to see is can boots stop this guy? Yeah. And, and that is the question. So that's, and I was thinking about this when I watched Meme machine, the barometer for me was an eighth, eight round knockout. 
anything below eight round knock or above eight round knockout was failure. He just snuck in with that. But when I go into every single fight, I kind of have an expectation. And I think the expectation is Boots Innes is going to have to go 10 rounds. That's my expectation going into this fight. And if he stops this guy, I'm going to be like, he exceeded my expectation. Yeah. So, okay. Okay, and then, as always, I'm the top rank Shield, so we're going to finish out with top rank. Uh, Jose Pedraza versus Javier Molina. This is a really good fight that no yep. one cares about. Um, this is a pretty <laughs> even fight, but, like, neither guy ever get Google Analytics search trends. Um, Jose Pedraza genuinely could be a Hall of Famer when we look back at his career. He's a three-division – or, no, he's a two-division world champion and an Olympian. And he'll probably end his career at some point, possibly a three division world champion. I personally think Javier Molina is going to win this. I do not understand why people don't promote battle of Olympians more often. Molina and Pedraza are both Olympians. I favor Molina in this fight. I think it's probably going to be, there's a chance it's the fight of the weekend. I think it will be the fight of the weekend. Um, Molina has a guy, that's a guy that really kind of dug himself out of a hole in his career. Um, and I give credit to him because he, he basically, he lost to Jamal James and then top rank, he kind of just fought on these top rank undercards and was kind of thrown in to see if he could beat it. And he wasn't really thrown in necessarily as the A side on a lot of these eight rounders that he won, but you know, he took out Hiroki Okada. He beat Ima, Ima, Amir Imam. And so he's on the, he's on the best run of his career right now. And I think it's a guy that 30 years old now is trying to fulfill you know, the expectations I think people had for him as a U.S. Olympian in that 2008 class. You know, Pedraza, I think we'll need to, in my opinion, I think he needs to uh, boost that resume a little bit more to start talking about Hall of Fame. That's just my opinion. Um, but he's got plenty of good wins in his career, and he clearly can still beat – um, you know, a lot of great fighters, a lot of, a lot of contenders. So this is, you know, it's, to, it is, this is to see if Molina can really, really step up finally to a higher class of fighter than he's been able to beat. Like, cause I think, you know, Imam's a, was a good win, but you know, Pedraza is a elite guy and a top 10 fighter. So, um, I'm going to favor Pedraza in this fight by decision, but I think it will be, you know, I think these guys are both really hungry. And it's going to be a great fight. So I think it will be the fight of the weekend. Yeah, I think it's going to be good. I, my only issue with Pedraza is, man, he has the, it's like they almost nicknamed him the sniper as a joke because, like, <laughs> he, he has habits of just being so inactive in fights. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's that, like a guy, a guy like Molina is going to exploit that. So the key for me, yep. for, if Pedraza is going to win, is he has to be very active with his jab because he has that that habit of just staying on the outside, not throwing punches, and assuming you'll yep. just stay out there. Yeah, and I mean, you're exactly right. He fell asleep against Zapata, and he got himself outpointed. He fell asleep against Lomachenko a little bit too much, in my opinion, um, in a fight where he did have a couple good moments. But uh, just, you know, he, he's not, he should, I think he should, I, I'm, I was a little disappointed he wasn't more competitive with Lomachenko. Um, though, he, again, he wasn't the worst in that fight, but I was, I wished it was a little more competitive and yeah. And Cepeda was like a fight where I thought he might win that. And he just, yeah, like you said, he just kind of, he was too inactive. So he's going to have to pick it up against Molina. Who's even you know, with Ray Beltron. Yeah. He had oh, times sure. of being in, inactive and I'm just thinking like, he's no disrespect to J Ray Beltron, but if you get fooled on Ray Beltron's going to do fight night, like <laughs> you need a new camp. Like, it's like, you know what he's going to kind of do. Yeah. It's just the fact that he's so darn tough makes it hard to stop it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go Pedraza, um, but close fight, fight of the weekend. Um, undercard, let's just mention real quick, F.A. Ajahaba will be making his top rank debut at heavyweight, uh, taking on Jonathan Rice, who's uh, a, you know, a Los Angeles, California staple, and frankly got this opportunity because he fights on the West Coast. Um, and then, uh, we're also going to have Felix Caraballo in action against, uh, Robisi. Oh, you're, break, you're breaking some news on me because I just knew about F.A. Ajagbe who yeah. recently signed with Jay Prince, in my opinion, the best boxing manager in all of boxing. I think that he does a fantastic job with all of his fighters. Um, and you, I mean, F.A. is probably going to annihilate Jonathan Rice. No disrespect oh, yeah. to Jonathan Rice, but I mean, F.A. is a really big guy, yeah. and he's got a solid team behind him. And I think what's neat with him is with 
um, ring star. I'm sorry, I'm stealing your thunder. You were going on, you were That's going okay. on a real um, thing, but I just get excited sometimes. Um, right. F.A. Jogbe was on his way to getting a loss at ring star because they were putting him in with the wrong guy. At top rank, he might be looking like one of the six best heavyweights in two years. Yeah. So, We'll see. We'll see. I mean, this is just a fight to keep him. I mean, Jonathan Rice is not the best fighter that uh, FA has fought in his career. So this is a fight just to keep him active. Um, and he'll probably knock him out in like two or three rounds. But it'll be good to see him back on TV. And yeah, like I mentioned, Robisi Ramirez. Yeah, I don't think they've announced it yet. And I feel like I kind of jumped the gun a bit, but I hurt. So let's. I, I apologize if this fight doesn't actually happen, but it is scheduled to happen. Is Robisi Ramirez is going to fight Felix Carballo, the guy that Shakur knocked out recently. But Either way, Robisi is going to be back soon and hopefully this weekend. And uh, that's a guy that I think they're really trying to move quickly. I think they really do want him to fight Shakur at some point sooner than later. I think they, they even though he lost his pro debut, I think they still really believe in him and they're willing to throw him in against high, you know, high caliber opponents for your fifth pro fight. So, or your sixth pro fight or whatever. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the Cuban looks. And he's old. Like you can't really wait on him. Like he's an old guy. He's twenty six, but he's old and he's old in mileage for sure. Like that's a guy that's had a lot of amateur fights, and a lot of them without headgear. So, yeah, right. He has been in the. He has got a lot of miles on him. So it's got to move him quick. It's like Lomachenko, right? If Lomachenko fights two or three more times after Teofimo, I'd be surprised. It's like yeah. Teofimo and maybe one more fight in the Ukraine, and it's over. Like yeah. he don't want to fight much more. Yeah, like he's had yeah. a lot of fights. He has. He has. He had an extremely long amateur career. So if he's like, I'm going to hang up the gloves in under 20 fights. Like, dude, I don't blame you, man. Take your millions and go on a beach. And thank you to user Banana Rama who said Box Rec Gray, an absolute legend. You, my friend, are an absolute legend as well. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Banana Rama, a legend of the chat, consistently jumps in whenever I'm trying to do these once a week now. But sometimes <laughs> boxing just gets me bored, man. Sometimes I just don't have enough. Um, energy anymore because my gang my gang ditched me when i went to live streaming um but my, the last guy on the top rank card i'm excited about is brian lua here's a yeah. kid from fresno california he's three and three with ryan garcia king rye and is he the greatest fighter ever probably not but he's a really aggressive guy he's gonna make some good action fights he's a guy that if he fought a guy like joseph adorno that would be a very exciting fight. And it's like, he's a guy that he's from Fresno near where I am. And I'm just excited to see him back because he had a two year break and his opponent, I think missed weight by a million pounds. And then he yes. didn't get to fight him. Yep. So, so they're, they're having a, they are having a tough time finding an opponent for him. And I don't think anything is finalized yet. So I've heard of a few guys that they were proposing up in my neck of the woods. I'm not going to name names because it ended up not happening, uh, but they are shopping around. They're trying to find an opponent for him, but he is scheduled to be in action on Saturday for sure. Yeah. I mean, I just hope that he gets an opportunity because he's been out for two years and it's not rocket science. He's going to be getting hard fights. Yeah. Because he's just been inactive for far too long. So, yep. okay. Um, that's about it for the show. Yeah. Any, any other topics you want to touch on? I know obviously you're a really good follow on um, Twitter. Like you say a bunch of smart stuff. And like, <laughs> if people want to like know boxing stuff, you can go there. You got like a podcast. I've listened to it a couple of times. I try to listen to it, but I get bored. I got ADHD. I don't really listen. I, I don't listen to my own podcast, man. It's all good. Uh, yeah. Follow me on Twitter. Box Rec Gray, B O X. R E C G R E Y. Oh, I spelt it right. Um, I have this wonderful flower portrait behind me that I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not in my usual house. So I'm enjoying this uh, flower painting behind me. Um, also yes. Uh, unprofessional boxing podcast. Please take a listen. Just Google that name and you can find my podcasts or, you know, subscribe. Uh, please listen. Um, go to boxrec.com for all of your, uh, you know, to information needs about boxing. You want to look up some data, uh, you want to look up some records, some history, go through a Wikipedia, get lost in the sauce, go to boxrec.com, log in. It's free. Lukey, thank you for having me on the Lukey podcast, the big dog himself for having me. It's all I good. good. You good see stuff. the big dog lifting 300 pounds, you stay dead lifting it? Ooh, dead lifting it and getting uh, getting eagles on the golf course, man. Mad respect to you. You got to show me how to golf at some point. I will, but you, I also got to show you how to bench press. Oh yeah. So man. if you go to the golf course, we're also gonna hit the weight room because that's part of the big dog, big <laughs> dog regiment. Because yeah. 
my goal, I think I'm going to do a 300 pound squat coming soon. And that's going to be a big one for the Twitter. The only thing I don't like about lifting too heavy is messes my knees up for a few days. I bet. So, I bet. Um, but I want to, I definitely want to do that for the internet. I want to give people about a 300, 300 pound. I'd like to do one where it's all one video where I do 300 pound squat, 400 pound deadlift, and then like a 250 bench, like just back to back to back. Because who would give you that, you know? <laughs> well, man, so that, I, I'm rooting for you. I want to see this happen. And uh, I like watching your, you know, I, I've been hitting off the driving range more myself. So trying to get back into golfing. But, uh, you know, respect, man, going out there, getting a 75 on the golf course. That's uh, that's pretty awesome. So Yeah, I mean, I shot 80 at uh, Spyglass. But what what's going on here between me and you and a couple of people watching on YouTube? Um What's going wrong with your golf? Like what? What's what? What's your issue with the driver? Just explain it to me. And oh I'll no, I, I, things. I just can't. I when I when I'm on the, I just can't hit 200 consistently enough that I'm happy. You know what I mean? Like I, I can definitely hit a 200, but I'm not hitting a 200 all the time. 200 is so. not very far. No, it's I not. Hate to break it to you. So no, like, no, it's fine. I know that. I'm not trying to say I'm a good golfer. I just want to be able to hit at least 200 consistently. So I'm gonna give you. Some, I'm gonna give you some tips. All right. Number one, put your head towards your back right heel okay and drop your right shoulder exaggerate your right shoulder so drop okay. your right shoulder down more okay i'm gonna do that and then also when you come down so look at this don't yep. come across the plane try to come down and keep your elbow in on your okay. rib cage so yeah so try doing that okay and try shortening your swing yeah. So okay. Shorten your swing. And then in your brain, instead of doing the swing, no matter what club you're hitting, think about going to a target just a little bit further, a little bit further, but get used to the contact. And eventually you're going to be doing full swings because now you're going to be thinking about how can you move the club. All right. um, so that's your first. Tip. I could get into the left shoulder and all that, but you'll just mess it up. So, well, you, um, you, yeah. I'll, I, next time I go out to the Collings of New Jersey Community Golf uh, Golf Driving Range, I'll let you know how I do, man. I, I appreciate the tips, but yeah, I'm just trying to go out there and uh, beat my friends. And, uh, you know, they're all so amateurs. So. <laughs> so, I mean, thanks. that's fine. We're all about getting to this money. So I appreciate you coming sure. on and um, follow Gray. Listen to his podcast. I listen to it every now and then. And he's a really good dude. Now, thank you, Lukey. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks again, man. Yeah.